Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. If you're in the U.S., or maybe if you're an American expat someplace else, you'll have noticed that Thanksgiving is almost upon us. And I thought it might be fun to return to food and wine pairing as a topic and muse a little about what I think goes well with the traditional fare on what's actually one of my favorite holidays. So let's talk turkey about food and wine on Thanksgiving. Traditional Thanksgiving dinners are peculiar as holiday meals go. First, they're typically built around a densely flavored protein, usually turkey, that's been aggressively seasoned with dried sage, thyme, and marjoram, among other things, and that may even have been brined for more and saltier flavor. The turkey usually comes with an array of side dishes that, with the exception of the mashed potatoes, are usually also flavor and aroma dense, with that being especially true of the stuffing. And unlike most everyday meals in the U.S., there's typically a combination of savory and sweet components, think cranberries and candied yams and such. And then add to all of that the fact that unlike most meals that combine diverse flavors and aromas as well as sweet and savory parts, most Thanksgiving dinners aren't divided into courses, and the whole kit and caboodle usually ends up on your plate at the same time. In short, Thanksgiving is a great holiday, but as a meal concept, it's kind of a mess, and it really is all over the place. What to do about such a hodgepodge of flavors and aromas? Well, for starters, choose wines that can stand up to them in terms of power and complexity. So your best bet will be to look for highly aromatic wines that have complex palates with strong fruit characters. I usually recommend whites over reds when making your choices because the aroma and flavor profiles of whites tend to be driven more by herbal and citrus notes like the ones you're going to find on the Thanksgiving table, as opposed to the berry and red and purple flower notes of reds that don't usually have that much in common with traditional Thanksgiving fare. Almost all of the dishes from the turkey on down to the potatoes and gravy will tend to have some heft and weight to them, so you don't want particularly light-bodied wines on your table, and you'll want to choose something that's at least medium-bodied. But you'll also want something that has good acid to help cut through the richness of the meal and refresh your palate. Keep an eye on the alcohol level as well, since alcohol will not only mask the fruit character of the wine you're drinking, but it can also overwhelm some of the more delicate flavors and aromas in the food you're eating. So how about some specifics to go with those general ideas? Well, to fit the bill I described above, I like intensely flavored Sauvignon Blanc, say from New Zealand, or from one of the more powerful expressions in California. Or, a nice, rich Alsatian Gewurztraminer really speaks to me, as does a Riesling, either from Germany or the New World, with Washington State and New York being two great choices if you want to keep the wine American, and Australia being another great choice if you're flexible that way. If you go this route, you'll want the wines to lean toward the dry end of things, and they can certainly be bone dry, especially if they have a big, expressive fruit character. Remember, you're going to have a mouthful of cranberries at some point, and there may be some dried fruit in the stuffing, so you'll need something that plays well with that. But don't be afraid to have your wines, or at least some of them, be just off dry as well, since there's a good chance that, on top of the aforementioned cranberries, you may also have some candied yams with straight-up marshmallows on your plate, too. And there's some terrific off-dry Gewurz and Riesling out there. Now, I consider those fairly safe and widely available options, but if you're feeling more adventurous, and if you think your guests are too, then go to Italy and try some Fiano d'Avellino or some Greco di Tufo, both from Campania, or to Spain and try a Rueda, made mostly or entirely from the Verdejo grape. Or maybe head to the Loire and go for a dry Chenin Blanc from Sauvignere. All four of these wines are or should be dry and intensely aromatic, but their aroma and flavor profiles will be driven by more herbal and savory notes than the first three that I recommended. I think wines like these would be a better bet if your meal is lighter on the fruity elements, in other words, less cranberry, less yam, less Waldorf salad or ambrosia, or, since Thanksgiving is usually done as a family-style smorgasbord, if you don't particularly care for the sweet and savory mashup and don't put those sweet sides, or at least as many of them, on your plate. Now, if you're feeling more adventurous still, consider putting a rosé on the table, either dry or slightly off-dry, depending again on the ratio of sweet to savory in your particular dinner. Rosé is famously versatile, easy drinking, and generally easy on the alcohol, and you should only consider it an adventurous choice because some of your guests may give you the whole, oh, I thought summer was over two months ago thing. Sparklers might also get you some odd looks, with a lot of people having a hard time with the idea of drinking one through the whole meal, and not just reserving them as an aperitif or for a toast. But again, the bright acid, rich aromatics, and general food friendliness of sparkling wines makes them a good choice to offer as an option. I wouldn't go with champagne, though, and instead I'd lean more towards a warmer climate sparkler like a Cremant from elsewhere in France, or a Cava from Spain, or something from the New World. 
These choices, especially the New World Sparklers, will have a richer, more tropical fruit character than comparable champagnes will, and I think that'll play better with the diversity of flavors on the table. Finally, and this would be quite adventuresome of you, again because of guest ex expectations, how about some sherry for Thanksgiving? Fino and Manzanilla sherries have a salty, briny character that'll play well with the savory dishes on the menu. And sherries are most at home in the diverse small plates world of tapas dining, which, except for the fact that you don't tend to dump all of your tapas onto one plate, has a lot in common with the Thanksgiving dinner concept. Remember, though, unless your guest list is made up entirely or more or less entirely of serious foodies and wine people, sherry and, to a lesser extent, sparklers and rosés won't usually be part of your guest's expectations, and that is something that you have to think about unless you really don't want to enjoy your holiday meal. And speaking of guest expectations, you'll notice that I haven't mentioned reds. Well, like I said earlier, I don't think they're the best choice, and I personally would be happy not to drink a single red all Thanksgiving. And I love reds, as anyone who follows me on Instagram knows. But you or your guests may want reds on the table, and if you do, a Pinot Noir is a good choice. I would choose one with a big, expressive nose and with bold fruit on the palate. California, especially the Russian River Valley, has some great high-quality examples of this style, as does Oregon. Grenache is another food-friendly wine that does well with roasted and seasoned dishes, though for me, Washington and California Grenaches tend to be heavy on the potpourri and rosebud aromas that I think clash with a lot of Thanksgiving food. Instead, I'd head to Spain or maybe to the Languedoc Roussillon for my Grenache. How about a Beaujolais? Sure, but spare your guests the Nouveau. Though they can have a lot going on in the nose, a Nouveau will lack the savory sophistication on the palate that it needs to stand up to Thanksgiving fare. So go with at least a Beaujolais Village, or even better would be a Cru Beaujolais. And that probably won't break the bank thanks to the great quality to price ratio you can find in Beaujolais nowadays. Any particular recommendations for a Cru Beaujolais? Fleury is aromatic and really wonderful for meals like this, and it's widely available, so that would be a good place to go, but you won't go wrong with any of the Cru. So at this point you should be sensing a theme in all of this. Since Thanksgiving dinners tend to be expressive, aromatic, and filled with lots of complex flavors, your wines should follow suit and be equally expressive and aromatic and bold in the flavor department. I think whites play better with the tea day flavors and aromas than reds do, but that's just me. Also, I don't think it's a sin, given how many sweet elements a Thanksgiving dinner can have, for at least some of your wine options to have some sweetness to them, though that's going to be a much better choice in your whites than in your reds, and don't go much sweeter than just off dry. And while big, expressive wines are a plus here, it's not just about sheer power, but it's also about lots of complicated aromas playing well together. So a big gnarly cab or zin or syrah or shard for that matter will probably end up overpowering a lot of the food that you're having. So I don't think these would be a great choice either. Finally, speaking of great choices, let me drop some hard-earned wisdom about holiday food and wine pairings. Thanksgiving, like most holidays, really isn't about food and wine pairing. It's about spending time with people that you love and care about, and the food and the wine should always be a means to that end and not the end in themselves. So what you should aim for is not that transcendent moment when the wine and the food take you to a new place and change your understanding of the world. Don't get me wrong, that's a worthy thing to aim for, but you're more likely to get it when everyone at the table agrees that that's what they're there for, not when most of your dinner guests just want to catch up and enjoy your company. The best thing you can do for your guests is to make pairing choices that let both the wine and the food be their best selves, while recognizing that many of your guests may want to drink something that they're familiar with, and that they may not particularly want to talk about what they're drinking. To that end, and this is very personal advice, if you have that special bottle that you've been dying to open and share because it's the perfect pairing, unless your guest list is small and filled with other like-minded wine lovers, the holiday table may not be the best time to bring that wine out, because odds are that at least one of your guests will have a sip, nod politely, and then chase it with a sip of the Diet Coke they're having. And no matter how much you try not to let it, that's going to feel like a carving knife in your chest. Let's face it, religion and politics aren't the only things that can cause drama at the holiday table. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. As with all of them, I hope this one was helpful and enjoyable, and if it was, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you celebrate Thanksgiving, I wish you and yours a very happy one, and I hope the wine flows freely and that everyone enjoys it gladly and safely. I'm your host, the Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.